strange new worlds episode review well everyone we're here one final time this season star trek strange new world season one episode reviews have come to a conclusion that's right we're all the way up to the season finale episode 10 entitled a quality of mercy and if you're new here i can't imagine you're coming to the season finale review expecting it to be spoiler free however if you are there are spoilers here so please bow out now if that's not your thing if you don't care that's fine let's crack on with one more piece of news i did cross the 100 subscriber mark earlier this week however since i am a bit preoccupied with the orville and strange new world videos i have not made a dedicated video about that since i don't have access to a community post couldn't put it there either so thank you for all of you who have subscribed if you're not and you want to Please click that button, leave me a like, leave me a comment. If not, that's fine as well. Let's crack along into the episode, A Quality of Mercy. Gonna start this one out as I have in the last few, reading the synopsis. In the season one finale, just as Captain Pike thinks he's figured out how to escape his fate, he's visited by his future self, who shows him the consequences of his actions. Now that doesn't explain too much, but it is a fairly apt description for this episode i won't ding it like i have the last few synopses so kudos for you this one kicks off on stardate 1457.9 we get a captain's log this time that's right pike himself is recording the log and that is a good 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 reminder of what the what we've been lacking as far as a lot of previous new star trek those captain's logs i know we've had a lot of logs this season i just want to touch on it again here it really does make the show feel a hell of a lot more like Star Trek when you open it up with a captain's log. That is just one thing I, I didn't realize I missed so much until I got it back. Here we go. We are opening up on this shot of an asteroid here on the edge of the neutral zone. It's outpost four. And uh, well, we're going to soon find out there is going to be problems afoot. But right now, our crew is only here in order to retrofit this. It's on the border of the neutral zone, as I have mentioned. However, here is our first mention of the Romulans in this season, as far as I can recall. This is pre-TOS, which means we have not seen the Romulans in about roughly 100 years since we had that war. The war was between us. However, we never saw the Romulans. That's a good point to remember if you aren't up on your TOS lore. The Romulans have not been seen in person by humans at this point. We're retrofitting this line of defense, for lack of a better term, on the neutral zone. We find out that Pike is now back with uh, Captain Patel. She is along with the Enterprise at this outpost. They hooked up again last night, so good for our boy. He's making her leftover breakfast spaghetti. Pike seems to be eating a hell of a lot of less than healthy for you foods. And to maintain that physique, I mean, also with all that drinking, good lord. I, I mean, I want the Federation technology to allow such a thing. Anywho, now we go over the breakdown of the neutral zone, the Romulan Star Empire. Basically, you find out that they're going to retrofit the space station and... They're treating the Romulans as more of a boogeyman type thing. They don't really think that they're the monsters that everyone thinks they are. We haven't heard from them in a hundred years. It's just, you know, this silent race out there we know very little about who hasn't been seen, hasn't been attacking, hasn't even been heard from in a hundred years. They want the upgrades, but no one really thinks it's that vital of a thing, that pivotal of a thing. This guy here ends up telling us his name. He is, his last name is Al Salah. And that's going to come back in a moment. I do want to point out, I am very, very enjoying the fact that they gave him this uh, alternate insignia here. Based on the original series, all the ships and stations used to have their own insignia. Uh, Delta, as we've come to know, Star Trek used to only be the Enterprise's insignia. I do like the fact that they're injecting a few others like that in this series. That's a point up for me as well. Then his son comes in. We find out his son, his name is Ma'at al-Salah, and that triggers Pike. Because, if you remember earlier in the season, he uh, came up with this list of all the people he's going to save in the future that leads to his horrific accident. Turns out, this is one of the cadets that is involved in that accident. However, it should be pointed out, two of the cadets do not survive the accident. This is one of them. And this just shocks Pike to his core. He has to leave the meeting in haste because he's having trouble processing this right now. 
He needs to define, define some definitive answer to escape his fate. That is going to be the crux of this episode. He needs to take charge of his future and prevent it from happening for the sake of himself and for the sake of these cadets, especially the two that die. So he is now determined to write these cadets letters to kind of uh, keep them away from the situation that occurs in the first place. He thinks that's a good start. Starts dictating a log, realizes he's having trouble coming up with the words, and suddenly from behind him he hears a male voice saying, Oh, you'll figure it out. You always do. And then, bum, 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 Pike, in the beautiful maroon TOS-era uniform, has appeared behind our Captain Pike. He has come back in time, at least so he claims, because... Our Pike succeeded in preventing these deaths, preventing his own horrific future, but in so doing, he uh, made things a hell of a lot worse. I don't even want to tell you the last time we've seen that. Probably, have we seen this? Un oh, I think we saw it in Voyager. I do believe we saw it in Voyager to a flashback a couple times of uh, Janeway's father, I believe. But aside from that, I don't know the last time we saw it. We've seen it in animated form, I'm sure, but in live action... It's got the upgraded look similar to how they've upgraded the regular uniforms with all the little extra stuff on the shoulders. So as far as I'm concerned, probably the most beautiful thing in this episode. I, I am a sucker for ships and I'm a sucker for these uniforms. And that was a plus. The only thing I was thinking is if they threw him in one of those motion picture era uniforms, I thought that would be fun to see, but I don't think that would have looked great. So I'm glad they, they took this choice. Anyways, he's talks to himself here, and he has traveled back in time, so he says, via the Klingon time crystals. Now, I hate the idea of time crystals. I don't hate the fact that this connects to the Klingons, even though we don't see Klingons in this episode. Time crystals in and of themselves, I think, are just ridiculous. I don't like the concept of a time crystal in a grounded in science fiction type of show. I could understand an energy source maybe, but this seems a little too vaguely magical to me to be a science fiction type thing. Nick pick, I know. Tangent, I know, but whatever. What are you going to do? So that's how he came back in time. He has our pike touch it, and suddenly he's like, well, the best way to show you why you shouldn't take change your fate is to show you what happens if you do. He touches a crystal and bam, voila, he is suddenly, I believe they said, uh, about seven years in the future. Obviously, he's a bit disoriented and he's presiding over the wedding of these two in this episode. So I won't spoil that now. He gets called to the bridge. Thankfully, because he has no idea what to say to these two, he doesn't even know who they are. And uh, there is a priority one distress signal from the outpost that they had been refueling and repairing at the beginning of the episode. They have uh, lost contact with them and they need to go and figure out what's happened. We've got Uhura here, seven years in the future, as the comm officer of the USS Enterprise, wearing a more TOS appropriate uniform with that big old gaping collar. I love that. I do love that. Slightly disappointed that they didn't give her more uh, original series appropriate Uhura hair, but that's a small nitpick. I don't know. Pike kind of goes through that situation. He bluffs his way through it a little bit, not really feeling up to his normal self. Calls Spock to his quarters and tries to tell Spock what's going on. Spock thinks it's more logical that he's had some sort of mental manipulation or he's out of his mind. Obviously, it's a bit of a tall tale if you were hearing that yourself. So Pike decides to offer, why don't, instead of us going to the doctor to have a medical scan, you give me a mind meld, you could actually see and verify everything that's going on, and then we can go into this together. I'm liking how they're kind of nipping these problems in the bud this series. Back in the body swap episode, I don't know if I really touched on this, they nipped that whole body swap shenanigans problem in the bud by immediately alerting others to that problem. So here, they're nipping the problem of he's out of time and nobody else knows by immediately telling Spock what's going on. And I like that because now we're not going to deal with a typical will they, won't they figure it out shenanigans for the next 40 minutes. They're just going to get to the meat of the problem. And I like that. I do like that. That's something this season has done a couple of times. We get to the outpost and what do we discover? Well, a strange ship that we as the audience understands, Ortegas seems to think it's the Romulans. Obviously, 
they're on the neutral zone. We, as the audience, know that these are the Romulans attacking these outposts, and if you hadn't already figured it out, we are, in essence, seeing an alternate timeline version of the episode Balance of Terror, where the Enterprise under Kirk at that time encounter the Romulans for the first time in a hundred years as well in a very similar situation. What we are led to believe here is the critical point where history diverged was not Pike saving those cadets, was not Pike keeping himself from the rolly BP chair. It was actually what happened after. So basically, by Pike saving his future, he was still able to command the Enterprise. Kirk never was transferred to take command of the Enterprise, and that means Pike, with a slightly different crew, is on the Enterprise still. He's the one making these first contact negotiations, first contact decisions, and that means whatever happens here is probably going to be what causes the timeline to shift so horrendously in uh, alternate Pike's future. Now we see that the Romulans show up, we're, we're contacting the base Obviously, it's already pretty blown up, not doing well. There's not many people left alive except for Mr. Al Salah. And while we are on screen with him, the Romulans power up some sort of plasma ball, the same sort of powerful weapon we saw back in Balance of Terror, and they shoot the place and they crack the asteroid. It blows up. Can't believe anyone would be left alive after that. We now have definitive evidence that the Romulans, or who we suspect to be the Romulans, are the ones attacking our stations along the border. Soon after, a mysterious green effect goes over the ship and they disappear. We know that is a cloaking device. They, however, not familiar with this technology yet. Spock, for his brilliance, he's able to deduce very quickly probably what's going on. Then, the USS Farragut, who was the closest ship, who also received the distress call, who was two hours away, something along those lines, pushed the hell out of their engines, warp 9 point whatever, 9.9 .9 or something, so fast that they were able to get there as fast as possible, almost to the edge of blowing out their engines to assist. And who is captaining the Farragut? Well, it is James T. Freakin' Kirk. That's right, for the first time in this series, we've got the actual James T. Kirk. Not Shatner, not Pine. We now have a third version. Gonna Go out on a limb right now and say his acting throughout this episode is good. He is not at all, not even trying to do a parody or an impression of Shatner or even Chris Pine. He is completely playing this in his own way. For better or for worse, I'm going to go ahead and say I like that. Even if he didn't come across as feeling like Prime Kirk to me, he's playing it his own way and he's not trying to do, oh, I am. James T. Kirk. He's not trying to do an impression. I dig that. I do like the fact that he's trying to make the role his own. Similarly to when we first saw Ethan Peck back in Discovery, it might take a while to grow into the character, so I don't want to give him too many down votes right now, especially since this is not the same Kirk we have become accustomed to. This is an alternate timeline. I do want to point out also, he is on the Farragut captain of the Farragut. We know in the original timeline he served on the Farragut. We also know that that Farragut was destroyed in 2257. These events are taking place in the 20, mid-2260s, I believe, which means whatever the hell happened to the timeline, the Farragut was never destroyed, and Kirk went on to be promoted to captain and take over that ship instead of being transferred to the Enterprise probably after Pike's accident. We already have some severe divergences to the timeline even prior to that. Pike takes the other Kirk, Kirk's brother Sam Kirk, here into the office to uh, kind of go over what our James T. Kirk is like, what we should expect from him, what kind of captain he is. Keep in mind, our Pike, seven years out of time, therefore, James T. Kirk, not a captain, would not know anything about him. That is a good point. I do like that because they could have easily just gone with the flow here. Pike is trying to get to the bottom of these things. Coming up next, we get a transmission being picked up from what they assume is the cloaked Romulan vessel because of some sci-fi shenanigans. They're able to pick up the message. This is going to be huge. They're going to visually see inside the Romulan ship for the very first time. This is the very first canonical time we in this universe are supposed to have seen a physical Romulan. That's going to be important. They put them on screen, and these are what the Romulans look like in this time. Oh, sorry, it's not correct. 
Uh, this is what the Romulan looks like in our timeline. Supposedly, this will be the same commander we met back in the Balance of Terror episode of TOS. I think it would have been kind of interesting if they had the actor for Spock's father, Sarek, in Discovery play this guy, similar to how in the original series, Mark Leonard played the Romulan commander and Sarek, but we already have the precedence of Majel Barrett not playing, playing two characters, number one and Nurse Chapel, but having two separate actresses playing them in at Strange New Worlds, so that probably would have been too over the top. I just thought that would have been a fun, clever situation. So uh, this is the first time we are seeing inside the vessel, probably made this physical thing so that we could intercept it. So they were probably trying to goad us into intercepting that, so the seeds of descent because they know that Vulcans and humans have a, an alliance, and they're trying to show us their Vulcan-like looks to uh, kind of break into our union and maybe uh, cause a bit of a, I don't know what you call it, a, a civil war, or at least a distrust, something along those lines. So that's an interesting thought. And uh, here we have the Enterprise and the Farragut. There's this comet, and they can tell that the cloaked Romulan ship seems to be heading towards the comet based on some sort of subspace distortions. They can't really track it. They can just tell the general location as far as where they're heading and they come up with a plan. So they believe that once it gets to the tail of the comet, they'll be able to track the distortion through the comet's tail, the displacement, all that good stuff. So that's going to be their plan. They're going to try and flank it on either end. And then we beam over Kirk, James T., to our ship so that we can have a proper introduction, a proper discussion of the plan. Obviously, we see the uh, meeting between him and his brother. This is, I believe, the first time we have ever seen these two in canon on screen together where they're both alive. They were supposed to be on screen together, kind of, in the 2009 reboot, but his scene was cut. And in the original series, the only time we saw... Sam Kirk on screen was after he died. I do believe this is the first canonical time we are seeing them meet. Touching moment there if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. Then they go to the uh, conference room and decide to sit down and discuss what's going on. I can't remember her name. It's her first name, but it is Mitchell. This, this other female character, she's kind of been promoted to a higher level than an extra. She's got a lot more to do in this. I'm saying Mitchell because for some reason that's leaping out to me because in the original series, Gary Mitchell was on the, the bridge in a prominent role. Is this supposed to be the Gary Mitchell stand-in of this universe? I don't know. She's been on the ship before. She's been in other episodes, so it's not like this is our first time seeing her. She just has more to do here. She kind of has the role Sulu had in Balance of Terror. However, there's no Sulu here. And uh, we do see Umbenga is still on the ship in this time. Possible McCoy is as well, because they did mention at one point, go down and get scanned by the doctor, and they don't say Umbenga. So it's possible McCoy is already on board, and Umbenga is just also on board. That would be consistent to what we saw in the original series. Well, so we've still got Spock. He's the first officer now. And we've got uh, Ortegas here. And she is playing a more of a, uh, a racist character towards these Romulans in this episode. Possibly something has happened in the intervening seven years or something has happened prior to that that we're going to learn about in season two. So they discuss their options. They kind of go around the table. Pike wants to hear everyone's options. And uh, one of the things that he is not sure about here is if they should attack. And I sh probably should have uh, waited a moment to go to that next slide, but it is what it is. And... They go around basically everyone, every single person except Pike is erring on the side of we need to attack the ship and stop it before they can do any more harm. Pike is the only one looking for a better way. So they go over that plan I mentioned earlier and they're going to try and flank it. It doesn't work out well. It was kind of probably a trap from the Romulan, Romulans to begin with. They get in a fight. The Farragut puts up a pretty good fight, but at the end of the day, they get blasted with a big ball of death and they're pretty much out of commission. Pike is able to fire some shots off, disable the Romulan vessel, but the Farragut is toast. It is, it is out of the ball game. Luckily, they're able to rescue at least whoever's surviving of the crew. And La'an, La'an Noonien Singh was serving aboard the vessel. She is a very different character here as far as her emotional abilities. She is very open. She's light. Uh, she hugs Pike right off the bat. Now, here comes a, another little element to keep in the back of your minds. Pike asks that the last time she spoke to Una and uh, La'an's like, uh, 
it's been a long time. I mean, no, nobody is allowed to talk to you. What are you talking about? So obviously there's some information Pike doesn't know here. That's going to come back into play later. So keep that in the back of your heads for now. It's a very, very interesting story so far. It's reminding me a hell of a lot. Like let's take yesterday's enterprise from TO or TNG, but make it futures enterprise. So it's kind of a, um, uh, it's a wonderful life crossed with yesterday's enterprise in the future. Kirk comes into Pike's ready room or office or quarters. I'm not sure where this is. And he says, all right, Pike, you're a good captain, but your hesitancy here just kind of blew everything. Please tell me that you did not hesitate for that second. If you tell me that I'll lay off it, but I think you're a little too slow on the uptake. I think you're a little too more imposing peace than we really need at this point. I think you are a little too gun shy right now, and that could cost us the end of everything. So please tell me I am not mistaken. They have a nice conversation, and this kind of seems to be the crux of the difference and the problem with the universe. Pike, too much of a cautious, looking for another way, peaceful type of captain. Kirk is the uh, cowboy diplomat, the firing off before he really knows everything, but somehow always making it work seeming to save the day at the last minute, come up with these plans that most people wouldn't think would work or even consider. That's the difference between them. And I think they're implying here because Kirk was not the one in sole command here. Pike was, that's going to lead us down the wrong path into the wrong future. And that's going to lead us to the horrible destiny. Pike comes up with a plan, hails the Romulan says, all right, let's, uh, let's both lick our wounds clean up our vessels, repair everything, because I want peace here. We both want peace. Neither of us wants to start a war, right? And then we go and have a few shots or a few scenes rather on the Romulan vessel. A little unneeded as far as the story goes, but it was interesting to see. Basically, this guy, he's an old, he's an old dog. He's been through that ringer. He doesn't want war. He doesn't care about his ego. He's lived through it all enough to know that he might want to actually trust these Federation types. However, the younger officers on his vessel, particularly the sub commander, isn't buying that. He's more of the egotistical, everything for Romulus, everything for the Empire type of guy. They have a bit of a clash. However, for the moment, they're going to stand down for a ceasefire. He tells them to repair the engines before the weapons. That's going to come back into play. We see here that Kirk has decided he's going to do some sort of last ditch plan. He asks for a shuttle, flies off in a shuttle on his own. That's going to come back into play. So they're setting up a lot of interesting things here. Then we have uh, Spock trying to fix the ship and we have a brief cameo of voice and arm of Montgomery Scott, assumedly. It's never explicitly stated. However, it's a Scottish accent. Um, he says the thing about he's an engineer, not a miracle worker. He's the chief engineer. It's obviously supposed to be Scotty. However, they didn't feel the need to cast Scotty yet. So they did everything in their power to have him in the show without really having him in the show yet. I kind of liked that. Um, I have a feeling based on what happened with Hammer last episode, we're going to get a real Scotty coming in in season two. Don't know if I like that, but for the moment, this was a clever tongue in cheek way to introduce him without really introducing. I'm going to stop right now and just say, I know I complained in my last video a lot of how this season or this series, at least thus far, is kind of turning out to be a direct prequel to the original series, like the original series 0.5 or something. I'm saying this now because it kind of goes against that, but it doesn't really. I really liked this episode in the way they did it. This is the way I want to see them handle the original timeline in an alternate way, in a cute, fun, cheeky way. But I don't want them to just physically become the original series when there's so much more to explore. And I think this is the type of way to explore that where you're not really becoming the original series. You are involving things from the original series in an alternate way, in a unique way but that's not overshadowing the actual cast and characters from your own show. They are still integral to what's going on because this isn't the steadfast timeline. This is, like I said, similar to yesterday's Enterprise type alternate timeline 
or kind of similar to what's that the visitor from DS9 where the future of DS9 didn't go the way we thought it would go after Cisco died. That's all I wanted to say. So out of the blue, a whole bunch of Romulan ships show up. That's right. Sub commander decided to contact the Romulan star empire higher ups. They bring in a fleet to uh, destroy our valiant heroes. This is the Praetor. We don't get her name. I'm wondering if this is supposed to be the same woman we saw in the episode from the original series where we stole the cloaking device. I don't know. It's probably not, but that was my first thought, so that'd be interesting if that is the case. Anyways, so she basically gives an ultimatum saying, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna blow you all up. You can do nothing about it. Suddenly, a whole fleet of Starfleet vessels show up. It's an armada of Delta-class warships. No, no, it's not. Uh, this is Kirk's plan. He took the shuttle to basically enlist as many automated mining vessels as he could. He now says, and this is actually a very brilliant callback, I think, that it's been a hundred years. The Federation doesn't know what the Romulan ships look like or what the Romulan technology is. Just the same way the Romulans don't know the Federation or Starfleet's technology and ship layout. Therefore, they could be very tricked that these are actually Federation or Starfleet warships. They have no idea. So this is going to be a big bluff, a big gamble, and Kirk is laying it all out there on the line, basically saying, all right, brought the fleet. What are you going to do about it? So we tell the Romulans, well, we actually have footage of one of your ships decloaking and blowing away our stations. And uh, that's actually an act of war. So if you don't get the hell out of here, we're going to share this and you're screwed. Then the Praetor says, oh, well, too bad that ship got caught. She blows it out of the sky. They destroy the ship that made the incursion and said, there, that takes care of that. Anyways, we're going to destroy you now too, Starfleet ship. So bye-bye. They get in a nice big space battle, as you could probably assume. The automated mining vessels aren't really equipped for much. Kirk programs them all to basically guard the Enterprise while the Enterprise tries to escape, make its way out of there so they can get the hell out of Dodge. Um, doesn't go very well. The Enterprise is a bit damaged. Kirk is able to get beamed on board on the last minute, and they do happen to escape. So thankfully, we are able to get away from that situation. As we're leaving, Uhura picks up a broadcast from the Romulan Empire saying, they have declared war against Starfleet and the Federation, and this is where everything is going to start going downhill and becoming the horrible alternate universe that uh, future Pike traveled back to try and prevent. Now we go down to sick bay because a lot of the lower decks were blown out, including the one where Spock was working. We find out that the woman here who was getting married earlier appears to be dead. They never confirm it. They never confirm the name. Going to go ahead and assume it's the same people from TOS. We also discover here Spock is basically destroyed. His legs been blown off. Half of his body has been burned away. Somehow he is still alive. And this is specifically stated that Pike is now feeling like he traded his horrible future for Spock. And Spock is, if he even lives, going to, in essence, have that same anti-life that Pike had. So I guess this can go on to show us that in this universe, if Pike did, or Spock suffered that fate, he never had the inclination to go to the Telosians or the Telosians never contacted us. So he never had his ability to live his life out that way either. Nurse Chapel has her first and only appearance in this episode to basically fill us in on what happened to him. She does a good job acting. He's, he's basically toast. Cut back to Old Pike in the quarters. Beautiful shot here of uh, April and Old Pike in the original pilot uniforms of the original series with like the weird turtlenecks. I like that too. I like a lot of the Easter eggs here and there's just a lot of fun stuff going on that doesn't even pertain to the story. It's like they kind of filmed this possibly as a series finale if they weren't getting picked up, although I'm pretty sure they knew going into it they had two seasons. So it does feel kind of like a full circle type of season or even more than a season calling back to the original series. The Federation in the Romulans only ever really have one path to peace in any version of the timeline. That path is Spock. In all the permutations where Pike is able to survive, Spock always pays the price instead, or something horrible happens to Spock. That seems to be the trade-off. It's if Pike is going to live out his best life, Spock is not, 
And since Spock is infinitely more important to the overall scheme of the universe, insofar as the galactic ending event, I believe Pike called it, Pike isn't necessarily unimportant, but Spock is more important to continue on and Pike needs to go down the path of his ultimate fate. I think this is a good way of wrapping up that sort of ongoing malaise Pike has had throughout the series. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope going into season two, he now has kicked that and he is more on top of things. He's out of his sort of 10 year in the future coma. He's more definitive. He's more action oriented. He is going to remember this. At least that's the way they imply it. So he decides before he travels back to his own time to sit down and talk to Kirk. The man who I guess he now knows is going to take over for him. That wasn't ever really explicitly stated, but I guess he understands that Kirk will be taking over the Enterprise from him. This is one thing I do want to point out. Kirk, the very last thing James T. Kirk says to Pike before they kind of cut back to our timeline is that his father was first officer of the USS Kelvin. It might just be a member berry to 2009. That means nothing. Anyways, we find out that Una is now being arrested for being a genetically enhanced Illurian. Captain Batal, Pike's best friend in bed, comes to do it. Obviously, that's not going to uh, end properly between them. I don't know. That's really how we end the episode. So that's the one sting for upcoming things in the future of season two, possibly in some sort of spinoff shows. I don't know. I wanted to point this out because it was very weird to me. The, the one security guy in the background, he just is staring up at the top of the transport the whole time. Like, I don't know why he did that. It was very blatant to me. He's just like, oh, I feel like he's he was an extra and he actually thought it was going to transport him. I don't know. It was very interesting and kind of took me out of the very last scene of the series or the season series is coming back. I've talked for a hell of a long time. Obviously, I really liked this episode. I liked a lot of the callbacks. I liked how they were kind of wrapping up Pike's storyline. I hope I liked the uniforms. The ship design of the Farragut was kind of cool. Again, I'm not entirely impressed with the all CG type of stuff they're doing. It looks kind of pretty now, but it's fairly video gamey, and I don't think it's going to age particularly well. That being said, poor aging technology is never that detrimental because Babylon 5 is still fun to watch, and so is the original series. So I'll probably do an overview of the whole series, but I wasn't as impressed with the last couple episodes as I was hoping I would be, but this one, from beginning to end, very few problems, and I just had a great time watching it. I can't imagine that they could have uh, done much more to spice it up. They could have probably thrown in some more cameos. I'm glad they didn't. I just really liked it. It was a fun story. It was a good story from beginning to end. We got to see our characters mostly. La'an got to come back without actually needing to end her story where she went off last time. I thought last episode seemed like a series finale, and it did. This was more of a detached story that didn't really take place very much after last episode. There was very little that took place in the present day, just the beginning and the end. So that was kind of fun. So you can kind of have two series finales, uh, season finales. I keep trying to jinx, jinx the show as if it's over. So very much enjoyed this. I'm going to have to think about my overall thoughts on the season, but this really left me on a high note. And I very much thought this felt like Star Trek more so than a lot of episodes this season. And if I might say so, might even be my favorite episode this season. I'm not sure yet, but I think this might be the first episode that I will physically want to go back and watch. I actually found myself when I was getting some of the screenshots, just wanting to sit down and watch through it again. So very, very pleasantly impressed with how they were able to pull this off. Let's see if they can keep that momentum going into the future. But for the last time in season one, computer and program.